Okay, welcome. This is Christian Bible Chapel Seminar. We are continuing our lesson this morning. Amen. In the three courses that we are taking today, church history. Church history. History is a is very important whether or not as a Christian, and you need to understand um, church history and go back and see what happened at the beginning of the uh, apostolic days of the apostles. Uh, what happened in the church at that time, the suffering, the pain, the persecution, and as it continued on even up until our time, church history is important. Church history involves recognizing certain individuals that helped get the gospel out. And those who were under uh, did not get any recognition, but they supported the apostles, the churches, and everything. So church history is going to deal with the various councils and creeds and uh, catechisms that was uh, uh, taught and brought out uh, during those days. And I know today in the church today, um, there's not much emphasis on church history and what happened in the past. But we need to realize whatever history we study, whether it's Christian history, church history, uh, whether it's secular history, world history, ancient history, uh, U.S. history, if we don't recognize and know history and teach it, then we're, it's a possibility that we're going to repeat the failures of past mistakes. And so that's what history does. It reveals to us uh, the, the possibility of, of past mistakes, what went on, so we as a people today who are looking back say, look, I don't want to repeat that same uh, mistake. Let's improve, let's do better. And I think the church has done better, but we need to improve on some things. So we are in our second chapter of church history. We already went over the first part, chapter one, in dealing with the how the church started and how the church was recognized, but today, we're going to look at chapter 2, the suffering saints. The years that we're going to look at is A.D. 33 to A.D. 313, as you see on the board, the suffering saints. During this particular time, at this particular time, we had what was called the age of heroes. The main word that's going to come up in this period of time, A.D. 33 to A.D. 13, is the word tribulation. Tribulation, also persecution, because during this particular time, during this particular time, A.D. 33 uh, to A.D. 313, there is a massive amount of tribulation and persecution upon the church, all right? And at that time, in this particular time period, persecution was overwhelming. It was, it was visually seen. It was done openly and dramatically, all right? Um, that's why it's called the age of heroes, because there were many, many, Christians in this period of time that stood up, that stood up openly and defied the government, defied the Roman government and empire at that time, defied um, error and heresies, and they stood up for the truth, unlike today, unlike today. Now, let's look at the apostolic church as it is persecuted in, in, in when it began its persecution. So what we want to look at first is we're going to read a little bit and then look at the 12 apostles. That's the, the beginning of it, how they were uh, killed. All right? Now, to, 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 um, to let you know the materials that we're using, okay, we already told you that we went to um, Chapel Chapel uh, Library dot org and pulled up our papers. Okay, this is one format that we're using. Also, we'll be using from the book 
Christianity through the centuries. It's a marvelous book. Uh, it's the history of the Christian church by Earl E. Countess. Also, we'll be using as reference and notes from Fox's Book of Martyrs. These are the three formative information books and pamphlets that we're going to be used for the course of church history. All right? And, uh, and we just thank and praise God. So right now, right now we are in chapter 30. Peter was put in prison preaching the gospel. How many of us was willing to lay down our life for, for the gospel's sake? Peter was put into prison for preaching the gospel, Acts 12 and 5. Stephen and James died violently as faithful witnesses to Christ. Okay? Faithful witnesses for Christ. Jesus had always already warned the apostles and anyone that followed him, they was going to face tribulation. They was going to face persecution because of him. Right? Let me repeat. Stephen and James died violently as faithful witnesses to Christ. Acts 7, verse 59 to 60. Acts 12, 1 to 2. Right? Now, Stephen, you remember, in Fox's Book of Martyr lets us know at that particular time that Stephen died in the book of Acts chapter 7. Other people died also who was captured, right? Now in Acts chapter 12, Stephen was captured, captured by Herod, Antipas, and he was, he, he was, hit, you know, he was, his head was cut off. He was beheaded, okay? Now Herod, in Acts chapter 12 now. See, this is, some of this is recorded in the book of Acts, okay? When Herod captured uh, Stephen and immediately crucified, uh, uh, beheaded him, the people were happy. Herod saw that the people was happy about this. He pursued it on in capturing Peter and put Peter in prison. All this is in chapter 12 now in the book of Acts. But miraculously, Peter uh, escaped. Now let me make a footnote on this for all Christians, everyone who are going through suffering and, and persecution, pain and suffering and tribulation. Let me say this. Each and every one of us go through our own sort of or type of persecution, suffering and tribulation. Now, you may have gout in your foot, and it hurts, and it pains. Someone else may have problems being talked about on their job. Whether you know it or not, whether you're in the hospital, whether you're in a clinic, whether you can't find a job, whether you're homeless, whether you're, whatever you're going through, each one of us faces our own personal tribulation, pain, suffering, all right, as a Christian. Right? Now, note this now. So when you go through your multiple persecutions and various trials and tribulations, as Peter uh, uh, tells us, Peter tells us that in First Peter. Let me turn to that. I, I just want to make a note because I know some, some may be listening and they're going through great trials and tribulation. Notice what Peter, Peter says in First Peter chapter 4. He says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials, the fiery tribulations, the fiery persecution, the fiery suffering. I added those words there. I, I, I didn't add to the scriptures. I add to the meaning of the word trial. Okay? The fiery trial is so heated. It's so against you. It is so painful. Peter says, Inasmuch ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may also, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, on your part he is glorified. 
But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer, as a busybody in other men's matters. If any man, if any suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that owe not, obey not the gospel of God? Now, when, when Peter says that judgment must begin at the house of God, you notice that Peter gives the meaning of the word house of God. He didn't say the church as far as the visible church, the structured church. See, I know in many parts of the world, the church is bankrupt, it's burnt down, it's persecuted, it throws stones and mark all kinds of uh, evil words on the church door or uh, whatever may happen. But that's not what Peter is talking about. That is a part of suffering and being persecuted, yes. But what Peter is saying here, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Now notice what he says. If it first begin at us, the church, the believer who is suffering, who is going through persecution and everything, notice what he said. What shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? Now, I sort of wanted to uh, 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 put that in there about suffering because I know uh, there is a possibility that some of you that are listening to me may be going through your uh, pain and suffering and persecution and tribulation but Jesus let us know that that's okay that he is with us that he'll never leave us and never forsake us let's continue to read at the first suffering of the church at the first suffering of the church came primarily from the Jewish community see the Jews they persecuted the ch Christian church first they the ones we're talking about the Jewish elders the Jewish, the high priest, see, Caiaphas and Anipas and all of them, they, they were still there. You know, they were still there after the death of Jesus when the church was uh, beginning to form uh, from Acts chapter 2 on forward. Uh, it was a lot, you know. Um, notice the, the reading that says, with the passing of time, the attitude of the Roman government, because the Roman government towards the Christian community changed as specific charges were made. Christians were accused of atheism, cannibalism, immorality, and anti-social behavior. Now let's define each one of those. The charge of atheism arose because Christians refused to worship the emperor or the gods of Rome. They say we had many gods. We only, we believe in one God. They the ones that had one, 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 one more than one God. So you see, after the Jewish communities lighten up on persecuting the Christians, the Roman government at that time took over and started persecuting the Christians galore. The charge of cannibalism was based upon a misunderstanding of the celebrating of the Lord's Supper. Spiritual language such as eating the body of Christ and drinking his blood was taken literally by many people. And they say, hey, you guys are committing cannibalism and you're supposed to be worshiping the one true God. Cannibalism. Because Christians, because religious services was often conducted in secret or after dark out of necessity, and because Christians displayed great love for each other, they were accused of immorality. Finally, Christians were charged with being antisocial, since many Christians found it necessary to remove themselves from public life rather than to uh, honor false God in social gathering or engage in unholy relationships. Now, I think I, may, I might have to uh, clarify that. Now, we are not antisocial in the perspective that we should stay away from people because how are we going to witness to them? We still have to live on this earth, right? but we should not be drawn to their 
manner and behavior of life. All right? We are to be separated, insulated in that perspective, not totally don't have nothing to do with people because we have to work, we got to go shopping, we got to bump shoulders with each other. The same thing happened during the time of Lot and Noah. Noah didn't just separate himself. The only time Noah really did separate himself was when he was busy uh, building the ark. Other than that, he went out and told them to repent and come to God because he's going to flood the world. See, we shouldn't be in a, in a, in a sense like, like Lot, who gathered among them, see, as a judge at that time, Lot, uh, fully engulfed in their mannerism and their way of life. And you see, many Christians who adorn themselves like Lot, all right, you're not going to be an effective witness for Christ. Sure, you mix with them, and sure, you work with them, sure, you... I may shop in the same store, marketplace. Sure, you may bump shoulders in the library, in school, in college, at work, but that does not mean you pick up their behavior, their, 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 their style of living, their, their, their language, and everything like that. We need to insulate ourselves from the world. We need to be salts of the earth, and we need to be lights of the world. The blood of the early church flowed freely, leading the path to Marathon, where the apostles, according to tradition, each of the apostles met a violent death, with the exception of John. Okay, exception of John. Let's look at that. The apostle Peter, Simon Peter, the first leader, of course, one of the first leaders of the early church was executed at Rome. It is said that he was crucified upside down. James, the son of Zebedee, preached in Judea. He was beheaded by Herod Antipas the year A.D. 44. This is Acts chapter 12. John, the son of Zebedee, labored in Jerusalem and then in Ephesus, among the church of Ephesus. He was banished to the Isle of Patmos. Now, this is the only apostle that did not face a violent, violent death. Andrew, once a disciple of John the Baptist, uh, preached in uh, Syntica, Greece, and Asia. He died by crucifixion. Bartholomew okay, became a missionary in Armenia, his death at Heracles. Thomas labored in Parthia, Persia, and in India. He suffered martyrdom near Madras at Mount, what we call Mount St. Thomas. Matthew ministered in Ethiopia. He was married. He was killed. James the Less preached in Palestine and Egypt, where he was finally crucified. Jude, you know, Jude. Thaddeus, the one that wrote the book of Jude, preached in Assyria and Persia, where he was killed. Simon the Zealot was crucified. And of course, the last one we know is Judas. He went out and hanged himself because he betrayed the Lord. Of the 12 disciples, one committed suicide, one died a natural death, 10 suffered martyrdom. Four of them were crucified. Let's look at the glory and the power of the Roman Empire because at this particular time, there arose certain leaders, kings within the Roman Empire that pushed on the persecution of the Christian church. Under the Julio-Claudian uh, dynasty, in other words, from B.C. 30 to A.D. 14, to A.D. 14, that was Claudius, Claudius, right? Then there was A.D. 14 to 37, Tiberius. Each one of these were Caesars. From A.D. 37 to 41, that was Caliclia. From A.D. 41 to 54, there was Claudius Caesar. From A.D. 54 to 68, there was Nero. Caesar. 
Let's look at the year of the four emperors. And during the, the then then there was another family that came on after Caesar had died. There was the Flavian dynasty involving the kings or emperors of Rome. AD 68, Galba. AD 69, Otha. AD 69 again, Valatilus. AD 69 to 79 was Vespadian, who had two sons. His, his first son is the one that shot and destroyed uh, Jerusalem in AD 70. He was a general, Titus. AD 79 to 81 was Titus, Emperor Titus. From AD 81 to 96 was Domitian, the second son of Vespasian, who was the brother of Titus. This was under the Flavian uh, dynasties. Another dynasty took over called the Antonini emperors. In AD 96 to 98, 98 Nerva. In AD 98 to 117, Trajan. From AD 17 to 138, Hyrenian. From AD 30, 138 to 161, Antinos Pius. From AD 161 to 180, Marcus Aurelius. Now this Marcus Aurelius is the same one uh, as portrayed, if you look at the movie, uh, the video called uh, Gladiator. But Marcus Aurelius in the movie was more nicer. In history, he persecuted severely the Christian church. In AD 161 to 169, Lucius uh, Verus. From AD 180 to 192, Commodus. Again, Commodus is, uh, was in the movie, the son of Marcus Aurelius. How Commodus uh, in the movie uh, killed his father, Marcus Aurelius, and took over. He had a, a fixation on his own sister. He wanted to uh, love her. But you see, I named all these names of the Caesars, the Flavians, and the Antonines to let you know that in each category, they persecuted the Christian church. They did not light up. They constantly persecuted the Christian church. Some of them did it so severely that the Christians began to hide actually hide themselves in what is called catacombs. They were uh, places 36 inches below the ground where they went and buried their dead, worshiped Jesus Christ, and it was tunnels of 500 tunnels, 500 miles of tunnels underground that the Christians went underground in order to avoid the persecution of themselves. But there always rose up a certain significant emperor every now and then that really persecuted the church. One of them was Nero. He was called the beast. He was called the Antichrist. All right. Um, the attitude of the Roman government at that time all right, intensified its persecution uh, against the Christians. There was a need to blame someone because Nero, now remember Nero, Emperor Nero wanted to revive, he wanted to uh, modernize Rome. But in order to do that, he had to get rid of the old Rome. So him and his accomplice set fire to Rome. Uh, so, but uh, there was a need to blame, I'm reading my notes now, there was a need to blame someone for that tragic fire in Rome itself. It occurred A.D. 64, and during the reign, during the reign of Emperor Nero. Beginning on June 18, the fire burned nearly so bright, it, bright it, it burnt so brightly for six long days. 
and seven nights, destroying the greater part of the city of Rome. Ten of the 14 sections of the city were destroyed. Initially, Nimrod, excuse me, I said Nimrod, initially Nero himself was uh, suspected of, of starting the fire. It was his dream of rebuilding the ancient city, and it, it got out. Right? Now, in all probability, Nero was several miles away in his palace at Attium. As soon as he heard the news, he went to Rome and tried to fight the fire. Still, the people glamour for justice. In order to dispel the rumor that, that was passed on him, Nero, uh, uh, Nero, uh, okay, uh, he uh, himself, he accused the Christians of starting the fire. The accusation seemed plausible. The church taught that Jesus was coming again and that the earth was to be destroyed by fire, Second Peter 3 and 10. So you see, Nero and his accomplice used the scriptures to, to, to falsify that the Christians started the fire to burn Rome. Second Peter 3 and 10. And so terrible persecution came upon the church. Some Christians were sold up in skins of wild beasts. Furious dogs were let loose upon them and their bodies were ripped to pieces. On at least one occasion, Nero held a dinner party in which he burnt Christians at the stake. His purpose was to use them to illuminate the, day, the nighttime skies when the daylight ended. And so the slaughter of Christians, the slaughter of Christians went. The ties of hostility, hostility embed and flowed in the strength from AD 68 onward. Only one thing was constant. Christians were made to suffer and die because of their faith. Now, during this particular time, I just read how that the apostle had trained men. There was Barnabas, there was Titus and Timothy, and many, many others. There were prophets in the early church. Right? The apostles at that time right, established the, the local church with the prophets. What they did when they left it, they put evangelists in charge. The evangelists trained men, and that's how they became elders. The elders were stationary in the church when the apostles, prophets, and uh, evangelists left to sow the seed elsewhere, while the elders became the pastors and bishops of that uh, particular church, churches. Okay. Now, as time went by, certain men who were taught by John, James, many of the apostles, prophets, and evangelists, some of them like Ignatius, Justin, and Polycarp, let's deal with all three of them. Standing out among the miles of the early church were Ignatius, a Cyrenian bishop of Antioch, Polycarp, bishop of Samaria, and Justin, the apologist, who wrote extensively and spoke verbally in defense of Christianity. These leaders and others are sometimes called church fathers because of esteem in which they were held by loyal members of the local assemblies. These church fathers were those who were initially taught by the apostles and the men who were taught by the apostles also. Right? They were called church fathers. The men who led God's people from AD 90 to 460 are frequently divided into four groups. Let's look at that. The apostolic fathers. They are the ones that edified the church. Now they're called apostolic fathers or church fathers, not because Remember, Jesus says, call no man your father. That's not talking about that. What the church did, they recognized certain men 
who uh, who actually sat at the feet of the apostles and Timothy and Titus and Barnabas and those who was taught by the apostles. Right? That's what the phrase lured to. But it real actually it got out of hand. Any label, any phrase, any word can have a good purpose at the beginning, but as it moved towards the future, it's exploded. And give you a good example, the word bishop. See how that's being misused? There's a hierarchy in the church today that the bishop is the higher elder in the church or higher minister in the church. And under him is a pastor. Under him. the pastor is an elder. Under an elder is a minister. This is this is a hierarchy that is not taught in the church, in the scriptures. I'm sorry, it is not taught in the scriptures. So from AD 90 up to 150, they were called church fathers. They helped edify and keep the church intact through the power of the Holy Spirit. Then there were apologists. Apologists is those that defend the Christian church against the Roman persecution. That's what an apologist is. The word apology or apologist is one who defends. The word apology means, and when we're dealing with this particular subject, it means to defend. Then there were those who were preliminists. Polyminists are those who led the church against internal heresy. When error and heresy broke out in the church, the polyminists, they taught the scriptures and said, no, that is wrong. He is wrong. He's starting a false error. He's starting a first heresy. He's starting error in the church. That's what a polyminist then there grew up also those who were theologians. They attempt to harmonize Christian teachings among the people, theologians. Okay. Again, let me repeat. There were apostolic fathers who edified the church. There were apologists who defend the church against Roman persecution. There were polyminists who led the church against internal heresies and error. Then there were theologians who attempt to harmonize Christian teaching the doctrines within the church. Now the first guy I mentioned, his name was uh, Ignatius. Ignatius lived from AD 67 to 107. Right. About AD 107, Ignatius was arrested by the Roman authorities because of his Christian profession profession and was sent to Rome to be uh, executed by being thrown into the wild beasts. The emperor at that time was Jardin, 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 AD 98 to AD 117. See, this is the reason why it's good to study history. We go back in time and say, well, who is this guy Ignatius? Well, he was the one that preached the gospel, that shared the gospel, and he didn't, he boldly did it that the Roman government arrested him and said, well, we're going to kill him in a den of wild beasts. Hmm. The emperor wanted this. Right? But you see, Trajan was a, uh, you, he was a moderate ruler, but he had to uplift the, the, the law of the Roman Empire, being uh, the highest of the leaders as an emperor of Rome. Though he did fear secret society, it was not Jarman's, Jarjan's official policy to engage in random persecution of Christians. He allowed no arrests to be made solely on the base of the anonymous tips. See, people would, would betray you. Now, remember in Matthew chapter 24 and in Luke Gospel, Jesus, when he was here on earth, he told them that they would be persecuted. People, you were betrayed by your own brother and sister, and you would be betrayed. Okay, so people at that particular time, they would give uh, anonymous tips because if anyone at this particular span of history uh, 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 told on Christians that they were holding church services, they was a Christian, they were court readings, something Christian religion. Uh, 
you know, something of Christian nature, reading it. Uh, they told some uh, official, the official arrested them. The person was given money, was given property or something, you know. And so people just start doing this just for greed. But uh, 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 Trajan, as emperor, said, no, I'm not going to do this on the base of anonymous tips. However, an open profession of faith could be dangerous at that particular time. If you openly went out in the streets and say, I am a Christian, Jesus loves you, he died on the cross, repent of your sin. You know what, like we do today in America and certain parts of certain countries, you do that. During the Roman government, you was put in prison and you was executed by various means. You couldn't do that under the Roman Empire. Okay? Now, Ignatius did that openly, defied the Roman. So, because the Romans had a law that if you openly came out and say that you was a Christian, then you was going to face the ultimate consequences of death of some means. That's why he was arrested and sent to Rome. Although all the all along the way, Ignatius wrote letters to different congregations, stressing the importance of Christian unity. The unity he taught was to be enhanced by ruling out all heresies, denying the deity of Christ. Finally, the hour of death came. Ignatius met his faith unafraid saying, may the wild, this is what he said before he died, may the wild beasts be eager to rush upon me. If they be unwilling, I will compel them. Come, crowds of wild beasts, come, tearing and mangling, rattling of bones and hacking of limbs. Come, cruel tortures of the devil, only let me attain unto Christ. This is what he said as he faced Justin Martin, A.D. 100 to 165. As Ignatius faced death bravely, so did the philosopher Justin Martin, who was scourged and beheaded in Rome with six other Christians. He was born in A.D. 100 in a small town in Samaria. Justin was a natural scholar. After studying the various philosophies of systems of his day, he embraced Christianity and became a capable defender of the faith. He wrote two apologies, apologies uh, to the emperor Antiochus Pius, A.D. 138, and to his adopted son, Marcus Aurelius, who would one day reign from A.D. 161 to 180. Now note the word apologies, as I already said, apology means to defend. So a person that defends the faith is an apologist. He also wrote a dialogue with Typhon, the Jew, in which Justin contended that Jesus is or was the Messiah. On his second day in the city of Rome, Justin uh, engaged in a public debate with a philosopher by the name of Crescens. Shortly thereafter, after, uh, shortly thereafter, A.D. 160, 166, he was put to death by Marcus Aurelius, who probably was influenced by pagan philosophers. Justin's last words were this, we desire nothing more than to suffer for our Lord Jesus Christ, for this gives us salvation and joyfulness, deliverance, that's what the word salvation means, before his dreadful uh, judgment seat. Let's look at one more. Polycarp. AD 70 to 156. Out of all of them, I, I, I love his dying testimony, but let's read first. Perhaps the best known of the early martyrs is Polycarp, who ministered in Asia Minor, what we call Turkey today, as Bishop of Samara. That's one of the churches that John on our Hopkins wrote. Okay? He was the disciple of the Apostle John. In other words, John the Apostle, before he got uh, sent to Patmos, Polycarp actually was taught at the foot of the Apostle John. Wow. In his messages to the church, Polycarp 
emphasize faith in Christ and the necessity of working out faith in daily life. See, that's what James was saying. Faith without works is dead. If you got, James is saying, if you got true faith, genuine faith is going to be produced by works. It's going to show through good works, holy living, obedience to Christ. So this put a dividing realm where you may say, I'm a Christian, but then you're still practicing sin of various sorts. True faith produced true works, true fruits. Works, good works, is the results of being truly converted. You're not saved. You are not saved by works, but works comes after true faith in your heart. When the hour of his execution came, the proconsul offered Polycarp a way to escape. He said, revile Christ and I will release you. This is what the proconsul said to Polycarp. Polycarp replied with this, 80 and six years have I served him and he has never done me wrong. How can I blaspheme him, my king, who saved me? I am a Christian. Now, he wrote, before his death, he wrote a pamphlet called Meditations. And, of course, Marcus Aurelius read it and still trashed it. Uh, it sounds like, remember when Paul stood before Agrippa in the book of Acts? And Agrippa said, Paul, you almost persuaded me to become a Christian. Paul says, not only you, but anyone that hears me. So as we come to the conclusion here in this particular uh, course, I just want to say excuse me, that Christian history is so important because many Christians, even today, face horrible persecution and suffering under the, the reign of their particular emperor, king, prime minister, president, whoever. Maybe, perhaps, in your country, uh, you have an emperor, a king, or someone, prime minister, president, who is who hates Christianity. Well, you are in the spotlight now because you have to maintain your Christianity and vocal, come out and vocally tell people about the gospel of Jesus Christ, knowingly that in Russia and many other places, you could be locked up. You could face hunger and persecution and death. All right. But I close in this, Galatians 2 and 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ that liveth in me. The life that I now live, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's Galatians chapter 2 and 20. I say this among you that are being persecuted on your job amongst um, family members, relatives, neighbors in the community, on your job, live for Jesus Christ. Shine as lights. You ministers and evangelists and elders that go out and uh, preach the gospel in the streets, be bold, be steadfast, preach the word of God, tell people about Christ, Warn them to repent of their sins or face the horrible judgment of God. This is all about the Christian faith, Christian history. Father, we thank you for the blessed word, our course. In Jesus' name, amen.
All right, we're going to move right along, and we're going to deal with our second course, uh, which is Christology. Christology, Christology is the study of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. It is the study of the person and work of Jesus, Yeshua Christ. I apologize for my back turn for you. With examining The life and times of Jesus. This is what our study of Christology is going to be involved. Again, if you like the footnotes, reference materials by David Hawking, Hawkins, we're looking at Christology and also we are reading Jesus and his times and also we're using a reference book also, uh, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah by uh, uh, Eldershine. Okay? Alfred Eldershine. And we thank and praise God for that writing there. All right? So let's pick up God bless and look at the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Now, in our book, we looked at, not only in our book here, but in the Gospels, in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, Matthew's chapter 1 and 2, Luke chapter 1 and 2, magnificently brings out as the synoptic Gospels about the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, to understand the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, it is so important that you have or come to grip and, and believing, believing the deity of Jesus Christ. Why did I say that? Why, why, why did I say that? I'm saying that because you have to recognize, let me pull my pages here, that Jesus is the Messiah. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He is the incarnated God. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. John chapter 1, that is St. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3 and verses 14. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word became flesh. Now, when the scripture says that he is the only begotten of the Father, see, you got to understand the word begotten because you take the Jehovah Witness and you take other cults, because that's exactly what they are. You take other cults, they use the false understanding of the word begotten for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, they use the word begotten as to emphasize, see, he is a lesser God. He is the son of God, but he's not God. He was created. He is the begotten of the Father. The word begotten has to do with relationship that the Father has with the Son. It has nothing to do with creativity, being created or made. So you see in the scriptures, when, when we read, this is, well, of course, of course, you're going to need the Spirit of God to understand the scriptures. And because Jehovah Witness, all of them do not have the Holy Spirit of God to teach them the Word of God, they're bored of understanding the Holy Scriptures because they think like a natural person, unsaved. And that's why Paul says, in 1 Corinthians, the natural man understands not 
the things of God because they are spiritually discerned. They cannot understand the word of God, and they never will until they are com truly converted. No Jehovah Witness is a converted child of God. It's, they really are heavily deceived as other peoples are. So uh, the relationship between the Father and the Son as, as it is expressed in St. John chapter 5, chapter five it's, it's laid out right there. There's a, a there's a unique relationship between the Father and the Son. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was. I'm misquoting. I, I I should know this, right? But that's okay. Let's go to the scriptures. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not made anything that was made. In him was life, talking about the word. And the word was made flesh. See, they, they take Jehovah's Witness, different cults, unregenerated, unsaved ministers, false apostles, false teachers, these antichrists, they deny the deity of Jesus Christ. They deny the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Any man, any church that denies these truths in the scriptures is not Christian. They are not Christian. Right? I'm going to read you something here. All right, here it is. It says, many deceivers, that second epistle of John, many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ, see, you look, see, we're dealing with Christology, and when you're dealing with Christology, it's in the, in, the, in the ancient church, Jesus was known as the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah. Christ, the word Christ in Greek is Christos. The word Christ means anointed one. That's what Christos means. In the Hebrew, it's the word Messiah. The word Jesus is our English word, how we say it in English. And it is the word Yeshua, which means deliverer, saver. Jesus the Christ. Now this, I said that because I, I want to read this now. First John chapter 2. That's why John says, who confess not that Jesus Christ. See, that's our English way of writing his name. Because we're used to in... The modern English to give a person a first name and a second name. Jesus' second name, his second name, his last name. Remember when people say, what is your whole name? My name is such and such. You know, back in those days, they only had one name. Or they call you Jesus, the son of Joseph. That, that's how they called you, the son of who you were or is or are. Okay? But they didn't have two names. Now, if you was prominent and you had money and you was dignified or whatever, you had two to three. Or if you was adopted, you had two or three names. But usually today in modern speaking, you have a first name and a second name. Okay? And that's why it's written that way in the Old English because it picked up that mannerism in the 15, 16, you know, like Martin Luther. So that's why when they wrote the King James, translated the King in the King James Version uh, of the Bible, translation of the Vulgar, it has Jesus Christ. Christ is not his last name. Christ depicts who the first who that first name is. He's the Messiah. Jesus the Messiah. Now let's read this. 
who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, this is a deceiver and an antichrist. See that? A deceiver is one who denies the basic fundamental cardinal truths of the scripture. He denies, that person denies the deity of Jesus Christ, denies the virgin birth, the two subjects we're talking about right now. They deny a lot of things, the scriptures, as being verbal, is, is verbally inspired by God. It is inspired. God spoke the word to these men and they wrote them down. And all scriptures is given by inspiration of God, the scriptures. Right. Now, a deceiver and an antichrist. The word antichrist, anti is, is the pretext, prefix, I'm sorry. Anti means uh, against. The word Christ, anointed, the anointed one. They're against the message, the teachings, the doctrines of Jesus the Christ. And this is what John is saying. This is a the deceiver, and this is an antichrist. He says, look to yourself that you lose not those things that you have wrought, but that you receive a full reward. John is carrying, is, is, is starting the, the teaching that Christians, if you are a true Christian, get out of Babylon, get out of Egypt. These are uh, metaphors for being in a false church, a false church ministry, following someone knowing that they are false, ignorant of the truth, blaspheming the teachings of the word of God for whatever reasons they have. And that's why the scripture says, come out of Babylon. Don't touch, don't taste, come on out of it. Revelations chapter 14 through 16, all right? So John goes on and says, whosoever transgress and abides not in the doctrines of Christ, they have not God. They have not God. Then John says, he that abides in the doctrines, the teachings of Christ, he had both the Father and the Son. Christology, the study of the person and the word of Jesus Christ. If you, if you deny the person, which we're going to look at first, the person of Jesus Christ, his personhood, his virgin birth, his incarnation, his deity, who he is. You deny that. You are a deceiver and an antichrist. That's what Christology is all about. Now, when dealing with the virgin birth, as we go back, to the Gospels. Let's go back to the Gospel writings. What had happened was that at that time, the Caesar, who was ruling at that time, made a public announcement through his foot soldiers, uh, with a guy on a horse or whatever you want to call it, who came to town and he says, hear ye, hear ye. You know, they practice that during the medieval or the Middle Ages. A decree went out from Caesar that whatever country that you were, your family was born in, you had to travel back and be registered for taxation. You have to go back and register to be taxed, okay? So the guy came and he announced to the people that you have to go back to your several country to, to, to pay your taxes, all right? I'm dealing with actually chapter one of our book here, The Life and Times of Jesus, plus Matthew chapter one and two and Luke chapter one and two is a combination. Now, last week, we talked about the genealogies or the history background of Jesus the Christ, that two individuals came together, which is Joseph and Mary. Now, Matthew gives the, the, 
background of Joseph, and he started with uh, he started with Abraham. Luke starts with Adam and brings it all the way down to uh, Mary. Right? So you have Joseph and Mary coming from the lineage of prominent Jewish men, right? whether it's Abraham or whether it's uh, uh, Adam at that time. And it comes down, Matthew uses the word begot, and such and such begot, begot, begot. But by the time it comes to verse uh, 16, he does not say that Joseph, uh, Jesus was begotten of, uh, begot, uh, Joseph begot Jesus. He doesn't say that. It just came out and say, and Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who was called Christ. Now, I want to look, we're going to be going back and forth from Luke to, to Matthews now, so you've got to uh, follow me uh, very closely here, okay? Now, in, in Luke chapter 2, here it is. It came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. This tax was twofold. It was a tax to help build certain buildings or whatever the empire wanted to construct. And also, during this particular time, it got a sensor of where everybody and who, the number of the people and who they are and where they are. Sort of like a census I think we have in America. Now, this taxing was made when Cyrenus was governor of Syria. All right. Now, now you notice in verse 2, Luke 2, 2, if you check even your history book, Cyrenus played a very part in secular history, and it was about this time that a, a, a taxation or a census was indeed carried out. Not that God needed support from secular history to prove that scriptures is true, but it just goes along to let you know that, hey, look, this, this thing is real now. So, and all went to be taxed, everyone to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, into the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Now, I, I, I see the, the whole point of us examining Christianity, we want to look at the life and the times of Jesus. Now, that involves verse 4. Turning your Bibles, we've been reading from Luke chapter 2, and verse 4. It says, Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth. See, it's important that you understand these districts, these cities, these locales, so you can understand the method, how people live, how they dress, their behavior, their actions, how they, when they went to the, 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 the marketplace, uh, how they got their hair cut, how they went to the barber. They were barbers, how they went to the sculptors, the painters, into, into the marketplace, how they bought art, how they bought pot, pottery, cups and bowls, utensils to eat out. All, see, all this is important to understand that we're like. So when you read the, the four Gospels, you know when Jesus, in John chapter 4, he, instead of going around Samaria to get to Judea, Jesus went straight through Samaria. And as a Jew, he wasn't supposed to do that. There's a history behind that. Who were the Samaritans? Why does... Jews refuse to go the shortcut through the town or the district or whatever of Samaria to get to their destiny in Judea. They were willing to face robbery and thieves on the road to Jericho and Judea, to taking that long way around Samaria, then go straight through Samaria. The Jews hated Samarians so bad that they refused to go the shortcut through their country to get to where their destination in Judea or in Jericho. Wow. 
and we see it says the city of Nazareth. The city of Nazareth was a poor, underdeveloped city. You was the poorest of all people if you lived in Nazareth. Judea. Into Judea, into the city of David. Which is Jerusalem, which is Bethlehem. I didn't mean to say Jerusalem. It was Bethlehem. All right? The house of God, house of bread, Bethlehem. All right? It was important that Jesus be born in the right city. Now, notice the prophecy in Micah 5 and 2. Thou, O Bethlehem of Judea, for out of you shall come the scepter, shall out of you shall come the deliverer. This is Micah. Five and two. So, so Joseph at that time was in Galilee. Now, if you if you if you if you, if you are one of those that have those maps uh, in the back of your book, all right. I'm looking at mine. Uh, now, Galilee was north. It was by the Sea of Galilee up there by Nazareth on the uh, Galilee was uh, a, a big area. Within the big area, there was Nazareth. All right. To the west of Nazareth was the Sea of Galilee. So therefore, Mary and Joseph had to travel north. They And that was quite a long distance, and you travel on a donkey, and remember, Mary was pregnant with child. They had baskets on tied on the side for their food, and they had skins of an animal where they put their water in. And so they traveled south. Now, as you travel south, I'm looking at the map here, you hit smack right into Samaria. Now, as a faithful Jew, you went around either the east side or the west side on the outskirts of Samaria. Now, most likely, they took the east side. They went to the east side and came heading south around, around, but not through Samaria, around Samaria in order to get to Jerusalem. Then when they hit Jerusalem, below Jerusalem is Bethlehem. Now, that took some days. That, that took some time. See, if you had a car, that wouldn't take no more than what I'm looking at the map, probably like uh, 45 to an hour. It's the distance what we would call from Baltimore, Maryland, USA, to maybe Washington or Alexandria, to Virginia. It took about an hour, okay? So uh, if you had that our fast transportation for the day. But you see, back then, it took days and weeks. So I, I, I don't want to jump the gun, but that's what happened when the wise men came to see Jesus. All right? And uh, when the star revealed itself to the wise men, and the wise men said, let us go to Jerusalem and see this great event. By the time the wise men get, got to Jesus, that time elapsed. Jesus was a toddler walking around, either walking or crawling around. He wasn't a babe in the manger. So you got to understand the time element. When that star appeared, when Jesus was born, Jesus was in a manger. Now, manger was it was quite different in the movies now. Don't, don't, don't. You see, that's why we're doing... Christology, we're not only dealing with his person and his work, we're dealing with the life and times of Jesus. Jesus was born in a manger. Some of the mangers were carved out of rock within the wall. You know, like when you go to the hospital, they have a platform. When you get into the bathroom, you pull that platform down, and you can change the diaper of the baby. That's how a manger in some locale in those days were made. It was made out of a rock within the wall. Then there were some mangers made out of stone in the middle of the floor or on the side of the floor. 
then there were some mangers that actually what we call bassinets made out of wicked or straw. You had to be most fortunate to have that kind of uh, uh, be born in that kind of basket or whatever. Right? And Mary and Joseph wasn't rich. Well, not until after the wise men of various sorts came and gave them certain idols. So they came down from Galilee, where he was at in Nazareth, heading south and got to Bethlehem, the city of David. Right? A couple of miles, see Bethlehem was south, or is south of Jerusalem. So when we read here in verse 4, Luke 2 and 4, Joseph went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth. See, the Galilee was a big district, a big city, a county, if you want to call it. Within Galilee to the southeast was Nazareth. That's where they were at. So they had to travel Okay, a distance of 40, maybe 55 miles south to get to Bethlehem. Now, they wouldn't have saved no time cutting through Samaria. But as a Jew, they didn't cut through Samaria. They went around. Right? They went around. It's, it's, it's like in our, in our country here in America, we have what we call... Uh, the state of Merle and Baltimore County, where I'm at, is when you take 695 and you take 95 south, when you get to, before you get to um, uh, Washington, okay, I'm trying to get this right, before you get to Washington, D.C., it was a, uh, a highway called, I think it's 695. You get on 695, now 695 takes you all around Washington. It don't take you inside unless you take one of the routes inside. But, but what is it? Is it 395 or 695 or 495? In other words, a route will take you around Washington and then put you back on 95 again heading to Richmond, Virginia or south. This is the same here in the map that I'm reading here, what Mary and them did, they went around Samaria and they kept for maybe 30 more miles down to uh, Bethlehem and when they got there and that's where we at right here it says here to be taxed with Mary her expou his expoused wife being great with child. So most likely she was at her ninth month at this particular time but they left early now so it took it, it took days it could took weeks to travel that distance from north from galilee in the city of nazareth down to bethlehem it took some time now it wasn't an overnight journey it wasn't it, did, it wasn't a week it wasn't two weeks it took a long time by the time they got there, Mary was heavy with a child. All right. And she brought forth her firstborn and wrapped him in swaggling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them. Now, let me uh, get a good picture. Okay, here's a picture. This is what I was talking about. I'm going to show you uh, two pictures. This first picture that I'm going to show you is where people, if you didn't have, when you came to uh, a city or country or district or whatever, and you, you stopped into a city and, and the hotels, what we call hotels, motels or whatever, was crowded, you had to go and live in a place like this. It was a rocky place in the mountains. And you went there and you spent the night or spent as long as you can there and you moved on. Here is what I was talking about. Uh, the, it's called the, the nativity scene in which children 
were placed in a manger. See here? I don't know if you can blow it up or what. And it was here that the manger, that many of the mangers were um, uh, made out of rock within the wall. And some were made at the lower part here, were made out of stone in the middle of, of, of the house, if the house had a roof. Okay, it didn't have a roof, as long as it had its surrounding, four surroundings around. So don't let the movies fool you how in depicting what a manger was in those days. You got to remember that if you was poor, as Mary and Joseph were, you didn't have a lot of places to go to because you didn't have the expense. So either you went into what we call a corral or you went into a barn or you went into a, a building where the animals at or you went into a cave or you went in the open field and you had your child. Okay, so we need not to paint a pretty picture of Jesus' birthplace and make it all pretty because it wasn't. Mary and Joseph was not well off. Okay? So they did not spend, Jesus was not born in a place of luxury. He wasn't born in a fashionable hotel or motel or a place in a house. Right. Of course, we know the scriptures, how that the angel came and he says, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which come upon all people for unto you is born this day. I'm at verse 11, Luke 2, 11, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, a Deliverer, which is the Messiah, the Lord, Christ the Lord. This shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaggling clothes. See that English word? Swaggling clothes. See, they did not have blankets. See, we got to get beyond. That's why the life and times of Jesus, it was scripts of rags, okay, like a mummy wrapped around Jesus, wrapped around the baby, wrapped around, wrapped around, wrapped around, all wrapped around, swaddling. See, we think it was a blanket. Then you put them in another blanket. No, no, no. That, see, if you was poor, you, you didn't, you, you know. And then it says lying in a manger. See, we didn't pick a manger, a barn, a well-heated barn with a fire, and the animals around and all that and this and that. I know the scriptures portray that, but we got to be careful, all right, because they wasn't the best of animals in that particular place that Jesus was born. All right? And you have to look at the background of the scriptures to see. Now, even though Jesus was born in that particular place outside, and most likely it was in an inner place, whether it was in a cave or in a manger, or in a house or some sort, it wasn't a, a, a conditioned, well-mannered, well-built place, but it was a place. Now, outside, there the, uh, a couple of yards or whatever it was, there were shepherds attending flocks. And the, the angel appeared to the shepherds. The shepherds got the good news and came to see this great thing. All right? And this is what the scriptures is talking about. And they came with haste in verse 16 and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they seen it, they made known abroad the same that was told them by the angel. They read on it as they wondered at those things, but Mary kept those things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned and glorified and praising God for all that they have seen. And when the accomplished time was came, Mary brought forth her son and called his name Jesus. When the child was born, the Jewish child was born, 
at the particular time they had to take the child up to be circumcised after the days of her purification. According to what verse 22, the law of Moses said, after your days of purification was over, you was to present yourself in Jerusalem to the to the priests right, to offer sacrifices, to offer sacrifices. Right. So um, in the book of the law, verse 24, Luke 2, 24, to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord. This is the book of Leviticus, chapter 15. It says a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. Now, turtle doves and pigeons were offered as a sacrifice to those who were who, who were poor, who didn't have. If you were well off, you offered more expensive items as a sacrifice. As the story goes on, you can continue your reading in chapter 2 concerning uh, Simon and Anna when they came to see the child. Luke chapter uh, 2. Now, if we travel back to Matthews, we travel back to Matthews, right? let's go back to Matthews chapter uh, 1. Now, now, we're going back, not only the back in time, but we're going back in scriptures because I want to pull out some important thing that Matthew brings out that Luke did. Right? That's why we got to bring the four Gospels together. Now, the birth, Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise when his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together. This was the time in which after the... Um, uh, when the father bequeathed the child, each, each other child to each other, to each other families, they gave them a, a dowry and things like that. At a particular time of age, the, the two, Mary and Joseph, had to stay away from each other for purification. If any one of them uh, got involved with fornication, adultery, or anything like that, uh, something had to be happened. Voice and all that kind of stuff. This is what it's getting into right now. Now, the birth of Jesus was on this wise when Mary was a spouse to Joseph before they came together. She never slept or had communion, physical communion, with Joseph. She was found with child. She was found with child. Now, you see, Luke picks, Luke tells us what it actually would happen. Luke tells us that the Holy Spirit came upon jo uh, Mary and said, this holy thing that is in you is of the Holy Ghost, and you're going to bring and call his name Jesus. Now, when Joseph got notion of this, he knew that he didn't sleep with Mary. So what he was going to do, as we read, I'm, I'm trying to make it short here, he was going to give her a bill of divorce. Let's read. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man. See, everybody knew Joseph. Joseph was a carpenter. And he was well known in that in Nazareth as a leading person. He wasn't an elder, but he was a leading high citizen, a just man. He wasn't willing to make her a public example, but was mine to put her away privately. That means divorce. He was going to divorce Mary. Right? But while he taught, while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She shall bring forth a son. See, the virgin birth is so important to believe in, just like his incarnation. You have to un, you have to believe this in order to become be, to be converted to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, your Lord and Savior. You have to receive his 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 virgin birth. You have to receive his deity. I didn't say understand. The Scripture doesn't say we have to fully understand the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. 
the scripture does not say you have to fully understand his incarnation. That's why the scripture says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It didn't say understand it because our human minds cannot understand and grasp the deity, the fullness of the deity of Christ, the fullness of the virgin birth. Because remember last week, we talked about last week, we talked about how that during the course of time, God planted himself in the womb of Mary. Mary did not have a male sperm travel up into her through her fallopian tube to pregnate her. God plant his seed himself in the womb. Now see, that's, un that's that to the human mind, that is unbelievable. That you cannot say that's contrary to nature. Now, if you get any book or Google it, it's going to tell you how a child is born, what it takes for a child to be born a man and a woman, not man and man, woman and woman. A man and a woman must get together. The man must pregnate a woman through his seed. The seed, the sperm that goes up into the woman must pregnate the woman, and it takes many months, and that woman bring forth a child. But life begins immediately once the sperm generates with the woman, life begins to pick up. No matter how small it is, it's life. And it grows into a human body with hands, arms, head, full developed, and it comes out of the woman's organ. And therefore, life had already existed from the formation of the seed of the woman and the seed of the man, right? as far as when they come together, right? as far as, you know, the sperm and everything. Joseph, when he found out about this, he said, now look, I know I never slept with Mary. Because it's I'm a just man and it's contrary to the law of Moses. I will not commit adultery. Because at that time, once you give your dowry to your future wife, father, you have to be separated from them for a period of time. That's the Jewish way. And in that Jewish time period, you are not allowed to touch her physically and sexually. In that time, Joseph was preparing the house for to bring at the final after the final ceremony, he was to take her to his father's house, which his house was built next to his father's house. So Joseph knew better. So in order not to embarrass Mary, he says, Well, I'm going to give her a bill of divorce and send her on her way. But the Holy Spirit moved upon Joseph in a dream. And he said, Fear not to take unto you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She shall bring forth a son. You shall call his name Yeshua. For he, Yeshua, shall deliver his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord, by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin, this is Isaiah chapter 7, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted, God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord bid him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not, until she brought forth her firstborn son, he, Joseph, called his name Yeshua. He knew her not. So the birth of Jesus Christ was supernatural. That you have to believe. He's very God with us. He's very God. Isaiah 9 and 6, unto us a child is born, a son is given. His name shall be called Wonderful. Counselor, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. See, I mean, well, see, the human mind does not understand it because it's 
endowed with sin. It's corrupted. Sin won't allow it. So that means it takes the power of the Holy Spirit to move upon the, the person, to cause them, their eyes and mind, to open to see truth as the scriptures speaks. Upon that, they believe that truth and receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. One more passage of scripture before we close. And to verify what I said, the scripture says this in John chapter 20, verse 20, verse 30 and 31. It says this. And many other signs did Jesus in the presence of his disciples which were written in this book. But these are written that you might believe, not understand, but believe that Jesus is the Christ. And see, that belief is, is uh, fiducia in the Greek. Fiducia, it means it, it's not an emotional belief. Because people believe in Jesus emotionally. They, they believe in Jesus intellectually. See, that's not, there are three understanding of the word believe. The third one is fiducia, that, can, that means faith, belief, and you can only receive that from God. God opens up the mind and the heart of a, of a sinner and causes them to hear truth, receive the truth, believe the truth, and therefore causes them to repent of their sins and trust Jesus Christ. As their. No one is born with fiducia, faith in God. No one is, I repeat, no one is born with fiducia, that means of strong faith in God and recognizing who God is, believing in the word and the person and all that of Jesus Christ. No one is born. We're born in sin and sheep in iniquity. We're born with human faith, which is corrupted by sin. We're born with human faith that's intelligent. We're born with human faith with this emotion, but we're not. We're not born with fiducia, because fiducia is a faith from God that is received after God opens up the sinner's heart and mind to enable them to receive faith with the word of God. That faith comes by hearing, hearing the word, and you receive Jesus Christ as your Messiah, Savior. These things were written that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the anointed one. And not only that, notice what he says. You also believe that he is the son of God. God in flesh. He has a relationship so bonding with the father and the son that believing you might have eternal. Hallelujah. Praise God. All right. Now, next next time we come, Lord's willing, we're going to pick up. Uh, we talked about the virgin birth. So simple, but a lot of people reject it, but that's okay. We talked about the deity of Christ, the, the persons of Jesus Christ, and we're going to move on from there. Amen. Christology, the study of the person and the work of Jesus Christ while we're examining the life and time of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for this course, and we bless those that are listening. We praise you for them. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. For our final course, for our final course, we're going to um, look at biblical eldership. So let's get our notes. If you obtain the book, uh, biblical eldership, that is great. All right. 
Biblical Eldership by El Alexandra Strauss. We're going to be looking at right? plus the notes from the Master's Seminar, How to Handle uh, Scriptures. Now, to my left, to my left, we have some notes that was left on the board from our previous classes that we talked about. And one of the things, one of the uh, key uh, questions, let me go back here. I'm taking my time because I don't want no confusion. I want everyone to understand this now. Um, we considered the question, all right, and uh, what is the meaning of scriptures and who has the authority to uh, determine its meaning? Now, also, we looked at, that's what's last week. We also looked at, in the book, Biblical Eldership, if you're not able to get the book, uh, stharris1 at gmail.com, let me know, and we'll get it to you from Amazon, and we'll need your name and address and everything so we can send it to you, okay? Or we can make copies of it and, and send you copies to your email address, right? But we need those that information. We had chapter four because we was embarking on the question um, about elders. We looked at the, uh, in our chapter uh, three, how that the establishment of elders in Israel, and we looked at Numbers chapter 11, verse 17, that the elders shall bear the burden of the people. Now, as you realize that the elders of the synagogue was the title name given to those in the time before Jesus and even during the time of Jesus and the apostles. But that phrase, elders of the synagogue, was not passed on to Christianity, to the church, just the term elder. Right? We're reading from chapter 4, chapter 4, of the Jewish Christian elders at work. The Jewish Christian elders. And you probably wonder what is what well, see the, the gospel first had to be presented to the Jewish people, then to the Gentiles and the world. Right? That's why Jesus said in John chapter 4, go not into the way of Samaria, but go into the lost house of Israel. The gospel first. So from Acts chapter 2 all the way up to chapter 10, 12, per, per se. The gospel went to the Jews first. That's why chapter 4 says the Jewish Christian elders. There were not no Gentile elders in the church in Acts 2, 3, 4, 5, and you keep on going till chapter 10, 12, okay? They were all Jewish, the Jewish church. The scripture is Acts chapter 11, verse 29 and 30, if you want to get your Bible, turn to Acts chapter uh, 11, which I'm turning, and we're looking at chapter 11, verse 29 through 30, okay? In the proportion that any of the disciples had needs, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. And this they did, sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. Now let's look at our reading for today. Receiving money from the poor. The first time Luke mentions the Jewish Christian elders is in Acts chapter 11, verse 27 and 30. Luke offers no word of identification as to who the elders were when they originated or how they were organized or why the Jewish Christians chose the term elders to describe their leaders. See, Luke didn't, he just went on and gave and said that the money collected was sent by Barnabas and Saul to the elders who was in Jerusalem. One of the grand door identification that you are a true Christian is love. Genuine love cares for other Christians. 
in the point that Christians in the early church, which needs to be practiced today, needs to look after the poor Christians and Christians that do not have. We have established today in our modern churches today, churches that are so wealthy and so rich that they bypass the poor Christian. Now, this is, you see, when you, when you notice in, in Nigeria or in Ghana, in, in, in South uh, Los Angeles or in Peru or in Palestine, uh, in Palestine or in the Philippines, and you know that there's a church struggling in that region, in that area, in your own hometown, and you are well off, you first identify with that church whether they're speaking the truth. If they're speaking the truth, sharing the gospel, preaching the word of God, ordained men is doing the work of Christ, but they're living in a poverty-stricken level, whether they're in their home or whether they're in a second floor of some building or in the woods or in the marketplace gathering for church services because they don't have a building, a structure. We that are well off should be able to wisely use our finance to help the brother. And see, that's the hallmark of the early Christian church of what they did. And so Luke is emphasizing this in chapter 11, chapter 12, and 13. Now let me read on. Let me repeat what I just read. Luke offers no word of identification as to who the elders were when they originated. How when they originated, how they were organized, or why. All we know that they took the money, Barnabas and Saul, and they went to Jerusalem and gave it to the elders who were already established in Jerusalem under the apostles. See, there was the apostles and elders in Jerusalem already. It is commonly assumed that the Christian, the Jewish Christians simply borrowed the elder system of oversight from the synagogue. However, let me read this now. However, A.E. Harley has challenged this view. He has challenged this view. He has shown that little is known about the synagogue elders of Palestine in the first century. Thus, he claimed he cannot be certain that the first Christians adopted the elder rule from the synagogue. What is clear and relevant to our study is that the chief official of the synagogue was called the rule elders of the synagogue. Luke 8, 49. Luke 13, 14. Acts 18, 8 and 17. Never appears in a local Christian congregation. The Christian congregation were led by elders with no mention of rulers of the synagogue. See, there's a difference. While the synagogues were led by elders with scarce reference to the elders, although similarities exist between the synagogue and the Christian congregation, it is obvious that the early church congregation were not merely reorganized synagogues because the synagogues was built on the Torah in the Old Testament. That's, see, this is a new this is a new thing now as far as the dawn of the day when Jesus was raised from the dead. It's a new. So the congregation of Christian congregation was not patterned after the synagogue. Oversight by the elders was familiar to any Jewish community from the Old Testament and the example of contemporary society to easily adopt. We can we can be sure that the establishment of the congregation with oversight by a plurality of elders was no arbitrary decision. Prayer and the Spirit's leading guide the first Christian community, Jewish Christian community, to organize themselves in this matter. So whatever, how it started, the Spirit of God moved upon the apostles to surname them these men whom the apostles trained and taught and put in place as elders. 
At the beginning, the 12 apostles were the overseers of the Christian community in Jerusalem. But at some unrecorded date, a group called the elders emerged, see what I just said, who were fully recognized by the brethren and the apostles as the community leaders. The saints of Antioch especially sent their contribution to the elders, although the elders' role in actual action distribution of the funds is not indicated. But the fact that the money was placed into the elders' care shows that they were recognized community leaders. Now, I'm, I'm skipping for the sake of uh, the book of Acts. You remember how that uh, they say chose choose ye seven men of honest report. You know, see what had happened was within the compound of the of the of the of the Christian church, the Jewish Christian church, and and, and all sorts of people was coming in. Right? The, the, see there was a there was Jewish people who were one hundred percent Hebrew. Then there were some who were Jewish who were Grecian. All right? This is in the book of Acts, chapter 6. What had happened was more attention was given to the Hebrew Jews, Christian community, than to the Grecian Jewish Christian community. So that came up to the knowledge by the Holy Spirit to the apostles, and so they say, choose ye seven men, of honest report. You read it, Acts chapter 6, okay? And these men will help equally share the distribution to both the Hebrew Jewish community as well as the Grecian, all right, Jewish community. Acts chapter 6. Now let's get back to our reading. The elders of the church then were involved in the practical care of the people. The elders of the church were involved in the practical care of the people. According to James, the elders were also responsible for praying for the sick. I think that's that's chapter 5 that we want to get into. We want to elaborate on that. God expects elders to have compassionate hearts for the physical as well as the spiritual needs of the people. Job could say, have I not wept for one whose heart, whose life is hard. Was not my soul grieved for the needy? Job chapter 30, verse 25. Moses writes, For the poor will never cease to be in the land. Therefore I command you, saying, You shall freely, you shall freely open your hands to your brother, to your needy, and the poor in your land. Deuteronomy 15, 11. <clears throat> Was not our Lord also concerned for the poor and the needy? Loving material care for the people is one of the most beautiful marks of the true Christianity. I said that earlier, didn't I? It is one of the truly significant ways we, can, we have of, of expressing the love of Christ within our hearts. So let us not be like the loveless selfish shepherds who Ezekiel denounced. They were shepherds with no heart for the needy. Their only concern was caring for themselves. Ezekiel 34 and 2 says, Woe to shepherds of Israel who have not been feeding, who have been, who have been feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? That's Ezekiel 34 and 2 solving doctrinal controversy. Some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. Acts 15, 1 and 2. Now let's read something up. And when they arrived in Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders 
and they reported all that they had done with them. Acts 15 and 4. Now follow me now. And the apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter. Acts 15 and 6. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them to send to Antioch. And they sent this letter by them. The apostles and the brethren, who are elders, to the brethren in Antioch, Syria, and Sicily, who are from the Gentiles, greetings. Now, while they were passing through the cities, they were delivered the decrees which has been decided upon by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. Now, for the time allotted here, we're going to look at the apostles and the elders, the, 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 the responsibility of the elders, who the elders were, their job, their function, their position, and how they need to carry it out. Let's go. We notice in my reading here from the book, the frequent use in reference to this Jerusalem council. See, they, they say, let's, let's take this matter. See, certain Judaizers came into the church, just like they do today. There shall arise false prophets and false teachers saying, and they're going to come. The same thing happened. They came from Judea teaching, saying, except you are circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. They was teaching in the church that unless you open your heart, unless you tarry, unless you get baptized, unless you join the church, unless you give a tithe, unless you give an offer, unless you live a clean life. See, that's, that's what is happening today. See, back then it was unless you get circumcised. And of course, only men can be circumcised. Okay. You can't be saved. So that's why we have our various denominations and churches all over saying you got to do this, you got to do this. So they ignore Ephesians 2 and 8. For by grace alone are you saved, through faith alone. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest it. See, they ignore that. These false churches, false ministries, false preachers, and that's how you can tell it. You examine their salvation first. You do not join a church because it's well-grown, well-organized, large, contemporary, beautiful pews, beautiful inside, glass and stained glass, carpets and everything, rich and finance, up the street, down the street, around the corner. You first go in and, and say to the preacher, what do you believe in concerning Jesus Christ? He needs to tell you that salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, nothing more, nothing less. If he comes out of his mouth saying anything else, leave the church, don't even worry about it. I don't care if it's your father's church, your family church, the church around the corner. If you have to go 5 to 8 to 10 to 20 miles up the street, into another district, go there and hear the truth instead of going across the street, around the corner. If your family church is preaching the truth, stick with them. If your, if, 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 if your relatives are preaching the truth and they're in the word of God, stay with them. If your church around the corner, whoever is preaching the truth of God's word, that's the church you need to join. And you must be part of a congregation, or assembly, a gathering of people for the purpose of worshiping God. Now, you notice in my reading here in Acts 15, according to our reading from the book and from the Bible, which is from the Bible, Acts 15, the frequent use of the word apostles and elders. Apostles and elders. Now let me emphasize this again. I, I know I'm repeating, but I have to. Because sometimes we're slow here. 
that's not a that's not a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's, a, it's in between. But nevertheless, we need to grasp through repeating, repeating, going over scripture, reviewing, reviewing, reviewing. An apostle is one that was called by Jesus Christ personally. He obtained signs, gifts, and wonders from Jesus Christ to authenticate his ministry. So was the prophets of old, as well as the Testament, as well as the New Testament prophets. They also had signs and wonders working in their behalf to prove their message when they say, thus says the word, the Lord. The canon of scriptures was not fully developed and written at that time of the early church. So there was a need for signs and wonders and miracles until the sketching up of the, of the, the epistles and the scriptures itself, the gospels, the book of Acts and whatever. But when they came to its completeness, we did not need. Once Paul started the writing of the letters and the letters circulated from Paul, Peter, James, and Jude, and John, Matthew, and Mark, and Luke, there was no need for miracles, signs, and wonders. You receive truth from scriptures. Once we preach the scriptures, I do not need a miracle or a sign to prove to you that I am of Christ. My proof is sound teaching, sound preaching of the word of God. And how are you going to discern that? You follow the scriptures. The, hope, the power of the Holy Spirit will enlighten you to know whether or not that man in the pulpit that teacher is preaching and teaching truth. There is a lack of discerning in the church today. People, the Christians are not discerning. Of course, unbelievers do not have discerning. They don't know right from wrong, truth from error. That's why the majority of them are in errors, erroneous, heretic churches today until Christ through his spirit, move upon them and open their hearts and minds to be born again. Now, that's what the apostles are, the prophets are. The evangelists were the ones stayed in the church after the apostles and prophets left, who first established that community. They left and went to spread the gospel elsewhere. They left the evangelists in the church to train men and to establish the church. Once the men were trained, they were called elders. Once they were put in place, the evangelists left. And the elders and the pap who are elders are the pastors and bishops in the church as ministers, servants of God. They were stationed in their church. A group of them worked together to preach and teach and to mature the saints in the word of God, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, 12, and 13. Read it. The name frequently used in reference to the Jerusalem Council was the Apostolic Council. Could imply that only the apostles de de deliberated together. This was not the case. See, many people think that only bishops and apostles have the right to regulate the church. This is wrong. You may have an apostolic council, you may have a council, but a council involves elders coming together to sort out heresies, errors, to correct, to strengthen the church in the word of God. Elders, today, elders. Another name for elders, bishop. Another name for bishop, pastor. Same people, Acts chapter 20, starting at verse 18 to 28. Luke writes that the apostles and elders came together to look into this matter. Clearly, the apostles and elders as they are repeatedly referred to, jointly shared in the proceedings. As they, as as they are repeatedly, they uh, they shared in the proceedings when the people came together. This close association with the apostles demonstrate the elders' significant place within the church at Jerusalem. 
as the apostles gradually left Jerusalem, the daily permanently supervision of the church became the elders' responsibility. The apostles and elders are thus joined before, because both shared at one time or another the local leadership of the church at Jerusalem. But the church began to grow from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and even to the utmost. Signs and wonders and miracles were fading away because the apostles and prophets had died off the scene. The church was left with evangelists, elders. The elder evangelists spread the gospel of Jesus Christ without any signs and wonders, just preaching the word, the gospel. That's all they did. That's all an elder an evangelist is to do today, is to preach the gospel in the streets, in the marketplace, different areas. Once a crowd is acceptable and a number of people are gathered, that elder, through the power of the Holy Spirit, will train men or a man to stay there and teach those people as that baby church began to exist and grow. The establishment of the evangelist then begins to leave and start his work over again in another place. The process goes on and on by the evangelist. The elder do not go out, the evangelists go out. So we still need to train men to be evangelists. We still need to train men to be elders. Okay? The apostles' unique universal ministry commission and gift, uh, and gift caused them to travel throughout the world while the elders who exercise only a local community ministry remain in Jerusalem. When Paul and Barnabas arrived in Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church by the church and the elder, by the apostles and the elders, Acts 15 and 4. Now, the reason why is apostles and elders, the apostles proceed in that verse, apostles and elders, because they are the figurehead as being the ones chosen by Jesus. Not that they are more important than the elder, because it's an it's a equal, equality that existed between, at that time, as now today, between elders that time, the apostles and elders. See, elders and the apostles. It, it, it shows us that there must today be the same equality between all the elders in the church. You, If you are in a church and you have three, the four, the 20, the 18 elders, each one of you elders, whether it's three of you guys, four of you guys, eight of you guys, two of you guys, three, whatever the number is, there should be an equal way of dividing the ministry among each others. Each one of you are so gifted differently than the other one. You both, all of you, preach and teach the word of God true. But one or two of you might be able to teach more advanced than others as well as the other one. But you all must have been taught as Titus chap chapter 1 tells us in verse 9, you must be taught. All elders must be teachable and able to teach sound doctrine. All elders preach the word of God. But each one of you may not discern and see more or less than each others. But you're still equal in capacity. The decision of the elders, uh, the decision of the apostles and elders at Jerusalem was vital important to the Gentile mission. Concerning the apostles' own greeting, the letter bore their authorization. Despite the elders' universal, excuse me, let me go back. Despite the apostles' universal foundational position in the church, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, and 3 and 5. That's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 5. 
they did not command or appeal appeal to their higher ecclesia position. It's amazing how you have a group of elders in the church and one who's been an elder longer thinks that they are prominent in the and see that's why they make him senior pastor. This is wrong. I, I know it's been done and it is being doing done even now by even more prominent ministers today. Well met, but it's wrong. You must not lower that other elder working with you in a lower bracket, in a lower stage. Jesus warned the disciples on the road trip one time that they are not to be like the Gentiles in a hierarchy position. Remember when James and John asked Jesus, uh, can one of us sit on your left and the other on the right? Jesus says, you, you don't know what you're asking. And the rest of the 10 got upset with James and John. And that is exactly what's going to happen. If you give all the money to the senior pastor and don't support the other elders, you're wrong. If you have a day for that senior pastor, you need to have a day for the other elders because they're equal in the sight of God. They are elders. If you call the first lady, the pastor of the church wife, first lady, you need to call the other elders wives, first lady. Stop demeaning and downgrading and having a, a, a hierarchy in your church. Every elder's wife is important as your elder who is, you say you're the senior pastor. If you are paid a substance of food, money, clothes, a house, or whatever by the church, if the church is able to do that, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 8 and 9, then the other elders need some compensation also. That's why the scriptures knows nothing about senior elders, bishop of a, over all these churches and everything. That's why the author here in the book, along with the scriptures in Acts chapter 15, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 5, lets you know that despite the apostles' universal foundational position, they did not command or appeal to a higher, higher, higher hierarchy in church. They didn't go around with a chip on their shoulder saying, look, I'm James, and I'm John, and I'm Peter, I'm I, I was Jesus by his side. Now, Peter could have did that. But you notice you, you notice something here. And Paul's right. He said, Paul, the servant of Jesus Christ, an apostle. He didn't brag about it. Why do our bishops and elders and pastors, why do we brag about who we are, these titles? They didn't go around calling each other, hey, hey, pastor, hey, 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 bishop. No. They just said, hey, James, hey, John, hey, Paul, how you doing, Paul? Why do we, see, we, ele we, we, get, we get into this stagnate that we're, 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 we're above people. We're, we're, we're platformed above them. We're, we're special, and that's why we got the miracles in the side. And, and, and people look, they, the people, they gurge at their foot, and they, they pray to them. They, they fall in line, and, and they pray to them, and they, and they do these things and give them their daughters and give them money because they're, oh, no, this should not be. In the book of James, it says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve. See, you know what? James could have said this. If, if he was egotistic, if he was big shot, he could have said this. James, the half-brother of Jesus, elder, apostle. He, he did not say this. He says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. To the 12 tribes scattered aboard, listen to me what I say. <laughs> it's amazing. Now, Paul could have did it the same thing. Paul knew over a dozen languages. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was taught in all manner of languages, scholarship, and everything. And 
you know, the one, even Matthew, very brilliant person, trained as a tax collector, hated by the Jews, of course. You take Thomas, well-positioned, highest servant in a man's house, had servants under him. But look at Peter, a fisherman. You didn't need to count. All you need to do is count. And he had to go too far in counting. You didn't need no schooling, which Peter did not have, nor Andrew. But you take James and John, learned men, father, family, owned a fishing company, went to school. You see, we, we, we look at elders and ministers, whether or not they got the DD, the BA, the MA, and all this. And, and that's okay. That, that's all right. It's good to have those things. But the point of the matter is you get so egotistic in these things and you think you're greater than someone else. Let me tell you one thing. I might lose a lot of people from this. But in the sight of Jesus Christ, my friend and one who I listen to, Alistair Bay, John McArthur, you know, uh, Donald Barnhouse, R.C. Sproul, I'm just naming a couple, Baudi, Bonshaw, and many others, they are on the same level with you if you are called by Jesus Christ, an elder in the church. I know sometimes we elevate people, Steve Austin and all of them, and that, you know. And that's okay, but we need to and appreciate them in a certain manner, not to well esteem them in a sense of idolizing them and being a perfect person, and I want to be like him. No, don't strive to be like another elder, another prominent minister. Strive to be like Jesus, not like Paul, not like Titus but like Jesus. All right. So the apostles didn't pat themselves on the back, but they say it was the apostles and elders that dealt out the decision. It, the scriptures could have said, and they, Barnabas and Saul came to Jerusalem and sat with the apostles. No, they sat with the apostles and elders. The apostles made sure that the elders had something to say. The apostles let the church know that we're not hot shots, big shots above the elders. So I don't know where we get Pope, Arch, Pope, Archbishop, Cardinal, and all that down, down, priest, you know, where we get Bishop, Vice Bishop, uh, Senior Pastor, Pastor, Elder, Minister, Evangelist. That's man's traditions. It's man's tradition. In keeping with the spirit of the New Testament, the apostles and elders wrote as brethren to brethren, respecting one another as free men in Christ. In his book, The Christian Ecclesia, F.J.A. Hart, well-known comment on the council's use of the authority bearing repeated. Listen. The letter itself at once implied an authority and betrays an unwillingness to make a display of it. The New Testament is not poor of words expressive of command, yet none of them is used. But along with the cardinal concordance in the release of Gentile converts from legality or legal requirements, that gets a strong impression of the opinion more than advice and less than a command respecting certain restraints. So you see, away with this, 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 this hierarchy, I'm better than you, I can preach better than you, I know more than you, I went to school and therefore I'm, I, I know more than you, I'm elevated of you, you are, you are not my equal. This is wrong. Both Roman Catholics and Protestants have used Acts 15 account 
to justify the authority of church councils and church courts. This is wrong. This is wrong. Now, James Bannerman, a Presbyterian scholar of the last century, wrote this. Now, in this narrative, we have all the elements necessary to make up the idea of a supreme ecclesiastical court with authority over not only the members, but office bearers within the local bounds of the congregation represented but also the Presbyterian or inferior churches courts include in the same limits. However, attempts to prove the latter system of church government by this account always project many of our own ideals into this monumental historic event. Such attempts then distort the meaning and significance of the original event. That's why the apostles and the elders work long side to side in Jerusalem as we today should work along with elder, other elders, not in a hierarchy elevation. These apostles and elders in Jerusalem forced to deal with the growing problem among their own congregation concerning the Gentile relations to Israel and its law. See, as the church grew, Gentiles gradually came into the church. Now, next time when we meet, we're going to come up and finish this in chapter 3 and go into chapter 5, which is praying for the elders, praying for the elders. Let's set this aside, and for 15 minutes that's given to us, we want to look at number three, uh, handling the scriptures. Now, as we said earlier, we looked at how that many times within the church, we mistake the voice of man for the voice of God. Who interpret the meaning of the church? Uh, excuse me. Who interpret the meaning of the scriptures? How do we determine it? Well, we see how that the scripture says that all scripture is inspired by God, right? No scripture, according to what 1 Peter 1 and 19 to 21, is of any, no scripture is of in private interpretation, correct? And therefore, we must use proper hermeneutics. We must exegete the scriptures properly. Because scriptures interpret the scriptures. The church does not interpret the scripture. The pope or the bishop or your pastor. It is the scripture that interprets the scriptures. And therefore, last week we looked at two words, very important, before we move on. We looked at the word exegesis, which means critical explanation and interpretation of a text by the text. Wherein today, predominantly in the church today, we have eisegesis, which is critical explanation and interpretation of a text by means of supplying outside meaning. Something outside someone else is saying or your own ideals or wording or understanding of what that scripture is. You cannot do that because you are adding to the scriptures. Scriptures are not to be interpreted on a private, private basis. No scripture is of private interpretation. The Apostle Peter says this. Okay. Let's look at, for a few moments, of what we call objectivity versus subjectivity. Three moments, let's look at that. Right. Now, we know that scriptures need to be understood, correct? And if they are to be understood and taught by the elders in the church or a teacher in the church, they must be correctly interpreted. We cannot afford 
passing down the baton of denominationism or church tradition because it sounds good or because of what the bishop or the pastor has taught us. We must deal with the elders in the church that who are the pastors and bishops must interpret the scriptures by the scriptures. And so what we're going to look at is objectivity, okay, objectivity and, <coughs> excuse me, the, inter <coughs> the interpretation of scripture. So important. I, you know, I mean, this is why you young young men, you you felt the calling of God into the ministry, and that is good. It's a good thing. Paul says, if a man desires the office of a bishop, of an elder, it's a good thing. But you see, then you need to place yourself in the means of a sound doctrinal teaching elder or elders or a seminar, a teaching, a university, a school where you can be taught properly the word of God because every seminar, every university, every church, every elder does not do this. It's sad. Very sad. We already looked at the word exegesis which comes from the compound Greek word which literally mean to lead or to guide out of by means of the text. Text, right? The text interpret the text. That's how you do proper hermeneutics, the interpretation of scriptures, the exegesis. You cannot afford bias interpretation no matter how good it sounds and pleasing to the flesh and the mind. See, while you're in your class and study, make sure that the teacher is giving proper exegesis of the scriptures and showing you that the text interpret the text. Let me give you a good example. Many prophets today and many pastors and teachers, they mess up with the understanding when Mark uh, 1616 says this. Remember in Mark 1616. These things shall follow them that believe. 1617. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. If any deadly thing happen, uh, if, if, if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. See, without proper exegesis in this scripture here, you will have a barn house of fanaticism, charismatic Pentecostal healing signs, exorcism, and all kinds of stuff roaming in the church. You must deal with this scripture according to other passages of scriptures which Jesus has said with the apostles' writings. If you do not do that, then you're going to make a great error within that community of Christian folks. Now, in looking at the word objectivity, let's look at that. Objectivity is when you're looking at a passage of scripture without a bias intake. You're looking at it without being judgmental in a sense of human judgmental. You, and, and your prejudice, okay? You're looking at scriptures as it relate to scripture. It says objectivity and the interpretation of scripture. Right? We already looked at how that the scriptures needs to be uh, exegesis right. We must not <clears throat> we must not manipulate the data, the scriptures itself, to bring about a meaning to the text. 
because if we do, we certainly do foul play to the scriptures. As a result, the biblical text is muted as you proclaim in your teaching. You develop a prejudice and a biased concept in interpreting the scriptures because you're giving sway to other meanings of the scriptures, which is eisegesis, and to instead of proper understanding of the scriptures, by the scriptures. You fractured the church in your myriads of group of sparring meanings, various different meanings. There is no soundness that is developed in the church towards the people. We are obligated to remove all bias, the human lens, pre-understanding, pre-prejudice, and whatever may be called. We must make it our ambitious to engage in exegesis in the real sense of the scriptures. We must be inspired to the kind, like Arthur, or excuse me, like Martin Luther has said once, the best teacher is the one who does not bring his meaning into the scriptures, but gets his meaning from the scriptures. What the reformers developed was what's called the anatomy, or excuse me, the analogy of faith. <clears throat> The analogy of the faith means that you insist on that the scriptures be properly interpreted. The scriptures can only be properly interpreted if we labor in the scriptures to find out what the scriptures is saying. We must, when we read Luke chapter 21, I'm going there real quickly to give you an example of what I'm saying. Come on, Luke. Come on. When we read Luke chapter 2, I'm just saying Luke 21. When we read Luke uh, and we see how when Jesus is talking about, just like he said in Matthew 24, when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation is near. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out of it. And let not them that are in the countries enter therein. These are the days of vengeance, that all, all things which are written may be fulfilled. See, right there, Luke is telling you that in order to understand what I'm saying, you got to go back to what is written to understand what I'm saying. So what is written that we need to go back to understand what Luke is saying here. Well, it, it's been prophesied of the desolation, the abomination of desolation, that's what's going to be committed by a ruler of, of a Gentile army and armies that's going to come upon it. Who says that? Daniel, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. So that's how you relate scripture. You, you learn the text, you get the meaning of the text from the text. The Holy Spirit determined the meaning of the text. You keep yourself away because if, if I get involved in this, I will give my biased <clears throat> opinion. I will give my biased opinion. And my biased opinion when Jesus says that there will be signs and great signs and, and everything like that, I can say out of the top of my mouth that, hey, that the coronavirus is God's judgment upon the earth. And that may sound good, but that is not what Jesus is saying in both Matthew 24 and Luke chapter 21. You can't use economical reasoning, society, what's happening in ancient and modern society and the plagues and curses and diseases and learning and development and, and destructions and wars of past and present to prove what the scriptures are saying. You got to use scripture to prove what scriptures are saying. 
Let the scriptures say it. Daniel says this. Ezekiel and Jeremiah. If you go outside the scriptures to prove that, like in Mark 16, that I can drink poison and it won't hurt me, you, you're messing up the scriptures. You can't, the scriptures there in Mark 16 is, is not allowing you to have snake services. People get into boxes of snakes and walk around, and as long as you have faith, you can walk around with these poisonous snakes and they won't bite you. That is not what Mark 16 is talking about. Mark 16 is not talking about drinking cyanide and look, God is going to protect me. That is not what Mark 16 is talking about. You cannot put yourself in a situation, in a dangerous situation, and look, I'm Superman, I'm a Christian, and you can't hurt me. Though the scriptures does prove that nothing can come upon you that the Lord uh, will put upon you, but that does not mean I can walk out in front of that bus and say, bus, stop in the name of Jesus. That's not what the scripture says. The scripture does not say I can lay hands on the sick with a disease and that demon or that sickness got to come out. That is not what the scriptures says. We take scriptures and we, we, we move with our own bias and prejudice and understanding because we think we can do what the apostles and Jesus do, which the scripture does not authenticate that. It does not validate. So all scripture must be, must be governed by scriptures, must be interpreted by the scriptures. I agree as we close. There are some things that are happening in, in quote, quote, in the name of Jesus. They look like it's of the, of the Holy Spirit. It sounds like the Holy Spirit whether it's a miracle or image speaking or healing or whatever. But if that was to take place and you see it take place, the scriptures are broken. The scriptures are broken. So it, what I'm saying and my conclusion is this. If you see a miracle and you see a wonder and it happens, the scripture says, no, it cannot happen because the, the days of signs and wonders are over with, and yet your eyes perceived it. Something is wrong. Number one, something is wrong with the scriptures, and therefore something is wrong with your eyesight. And if something is wrong with the scriptures, then we can't follow this. Because all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is impregnable. It is impeccable. It is inspirational by God. We must not be deceived like Jamie's and Jamie's that came and threw their staff down before Pharaoh with Moses' staff and, and, and it looked and appeared that that dead staff of the magician came alive. It did not. Dead cannot come alive unless the power of God gives it life. So therefore, those statues, those stump, those poles that they threw down with Moses' pole, it deceived the people in thinking that it did come alive, and yet Moses really came alive, and it ate up the other uh, so-called serpents. There's a lot of miracles, a lot of wonders are happening and it seemed appearing to be of God, but it cannot be of God because it breaks the scriptures. Cannot overemphasize that. That's why there needs to be discerning in the church, especially by the elders. There needs to be sound teaching constantly in the church or people will run after anything. And people love miracles, signs, and wonders. They are not satisfied with this alone, the word of God. God help us. Father, we thank you for our courses today in church history, in Christology, in biblical eldership. We pray that both elders and Christians will learn something, will grow. Strengthen the man of God, his faith in you. Give him the discernment and the power to preach the word, the gospel of Jesus Christ and the doctrines of Christ. 
that it will glorify you. Blessed is thy name, O God, we pray in Jesus' name. This Sunday morning at 6.30, sunrise service here at Christian Bible Chapel on YouTube and Facebook. We'll be studying the beginning the study of the, the, of the church, and we're dealing with the expository preaching and teaching from the book of Revelation, USA time, 6.30. If you can, join us. Amen, amen. Praise God. If not, do not do not, how can I say this in a scriptural way, because I don't want to use Hebrews 10, 25 like everybody else uses. That's wrong. But I say to us as Christians, join together with fellow brothers in Christ this Lord's Day. Whether y'all meet in the woods, whether y'all meet on the second floor, in the back of the store, in a church building, in some structure, in an apartment, in a home, in the basement, come together with other saints. Seek out places where the word of God is being preached and go there that Sunday and learn the truth. If you're working at night, working in the day, go there at night. If you're working at night, go in the day. Somehow find a place that you can come together and fellowship with the saints of God on the Lord's day. Pray to the Lord that he will lead you to that. Fundamental, doctrinal, sound, preaching, church, and man of God. He will. Honestly, he will. God bless you. Amen.